Welcome. Today is Friday, July 24th, 2020, and this is a NERI webinar intended to, to disseminate educational information and research outcomes around natural hazards and the built environment. For more information about NERI, the Natural Hazards Research Infrastructure, visit the NERI website at designsafe-ci.org, where you can find links to the Sim Center and the NERI Learning Center. Today's webinar is hosted by the Natural Hazards Engineering Re Research Infrastructures Computational Modeling and Simulation Center and Design Safe. This webinar is supported by the National Science Foundation under awards 1612843 and 1520817. Any statements in this webinar are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent the views of the National Science Foundation. Today, we're, born, we're joined by Andrew Kennedy. He is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences at the University of Notre Dame. He has worked in many aspects of coastal science and engineering, with a recent, recent focus on storm inundation process and damage. The title of his presentation is Inundation and Wave Loading Processes in Hurricane Scenarios. And with that, Andrew, I invite you to begin. Okay, thanks, Matt. I'd like to thank the uh, Sim Center for inviting me here. Um, it's it's a, an honor to be on the webinar. And I'll say right at the beginning that at the end of my presentation, there's a big long list of references of things that I've been showing. So um, you don't have to write things down while we're going on. You can wait till the end. And um, I'd also like to thank anyone that I've used their work, but I haven't. Uh, I haven't acknowledged them yet. So this uh, webinar, um, the way I've set it up, could have gone a bunch of different ways. I've set it up more as an introduction scenario for people who might not have a background in coastal and ocean engineering and science, um, particularly structural engineering students, because I think these are the uh, largest part of, of the audience. Um, for those who do, um, a lot of the parts will seem fairly uh, basic. Um, some new research results will be shown, but uh, a lot of it is just walking people through what goes on in these inundation scenarios and hurricanes. So I'd like to begin just by showing a video taken by uh, Stephen Joaquin Morris of wave loading on a structural array. This was done in the Oregon State University uh, wave basin um, last year, and you can see very large impacts and, and loading there. Um, this is a, a typical thing that happens and we're going to talk about what leads to this and what will happen. So why do we care? Um, this is just a list of the recent hurricanes in the last 15 years with major damage and you'll probably recognize the names of most or maybe even all of them. Um, th these are just ones that impacted the United States or, um, or close to the United States. So there's, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a tropical storm coming to Texas. Um, hopefully it won't be that bad. And there's one behind it and we'll find out about that one. So lots going on. This is an example of real damage. This is taken from the Philippines in 2013. It is six meters above sea level and hundred meters inland. You can see from the video, it started out as a completely dry bed. There had been some waves there before, but it was completely dry. And then within a few seconds, you had several meters of inundation going seven, eight meters per second, wiped out the entire house and there it's, it's gone. That's where it used to be. And it is completely wiped out in just a few seconds. And this is a typical thing that will happen uh, it's called infragravity run up and, and damage. And let me go back to the beginning again. So dry, and then the wave comes. You can see there's been some damage before and it's pretty much over from there. If you look closely, you can see the roof of another house going by in a few seconds. Okay, so how do we get there? And that's, that's what I'm going to um, run through here. And if you're really on the ball, you might ask, how did the guy who took this video survive when the house next to him was completely washed away. And that's another thing we're going to start looking at that has to do with sheltering effects. Okay, one more example. This is from Texas in 2008, Hurricane Ike. This is known as the last house standing. 
um, which, which is right here. Um, this entire area was filled with houses, not anymore. Why did this one uh, remain? Why are the other ones taken away? We'll have a look. Okay, now a lot of people here will have been from the wind and seismic area and the loading is very different for coastal inundation loads. Uh, seismic loading, it's over very large areas. It's very slowly in space, um, might be affected by soils or other structures around it, but the general loads are not that different. Wind, similar, large scale, can be varied by upstream roughness and a few other things, but it's very slowly in space. Inundation loads vary strongly, or they can vary strongly in 10 meters ground distance and half a meter vertical elevation. And the best example I know of this is something from Hurricane Ike, which is just where we saw the last house standing. This is a distance from the Gulf of Mexico, so zeros at the shoreline. This is the elevation of the lowest horizontal structural member, which is just a measure of the elevation. And each of these symbols represents a house. The red ones are surviving, the blue ones are destroyed, and you can see there's a very strong division. And if you just look, it's about half meter elevation. So half meter elevation was the difference between survival and destruction here. And we'll, we'll look at why. Okay, to understand this, we need to understand the processes to get there. And I'm going to walk you through these in fairly quick form. Um, and so we can have a good idea, starting with storm surge, wind generated waves, how those waves change in shallow water, wave run up and loading, and then the structural damage. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, resilience and, and uh, damage reduction. So, but to figure out what happens at a particular location, we need to look at the entire chain up till then. Okay, let's start with storm surge. Storm surge, everyone knows what it is. Um, happens during hurricanes, happens during big storms. There are two main processes, and the processes are quite different. Um, the first one, which is easier, is called the inverse barometer effect. If you have low pressure during the storm and higher pressure outside the storm, the low pressure during the storm right here, delta P is pressure deficit, will suck up water and increase the surface elevation. It's proportional to the pressure deficit, works in all depths. There's some other proportionalities in there that I'm just going to leave out, but you just need to know high pressure deficit, which means strong storm, uh, high surface elevation. And this maxes out at one meter. More typical would be half a meter, uh, which is not the major component in the worst cases. The worst component for surge is wind shear stress. And the gradient of the surface elevation, so the tilt of the surface elevation is proportional to the wind speed squared divided by the water depth with a few other things thrown in like coefficients that I'm going to ignore. Um, and then if this is the gradient, the uh, actual surge at the shoreline scales like the wind speed squared divided by water depth times R, which is some storm size measure. So without doing any more work, we know that the large surge occurs for strong storms, high wind speed, large storms, and shallow water depths. And this can reach five, six, seven, eight meters in the worst case, which would be Hurricane Katrina. Uh, more typical in a strong storm would be three, four meters. Five, six is pretty large and Katrina is Katrina. This is a simple example of what surge looks like just from the wind shear. This is the distance, so offshore, and then this is the shoreline, 100 kilometers um, for a linearly sloping bed. If the maximum depth is 50 meters, we're getting three point something meter surge from a 40 meter per second steady wind. This is an analytical solution, which I'm not going to write down because it wouldn't really help very much. If it's 100 meters maximum depth, we get a lot less. So as it gets shallower, um, we get significantly more surge. If it was 25 meters maximum depth, it would be way up here. If the bed is flat with 100 meters or 50 meters constant depth, we get a lot less surge. These are on the same scale, but a lot less surge still with the shallower depths, higher surge. So these are, are good at showing us the basics of how these work, but they, they won't really give us details. You can't use these for predicting the surge during Hurricane Katrina um, without getting a factor of two wrong. because so it's just more complicated than that. To do that, you need um, big computations. And for the highest accuracy 
people spend a lot of time making high resolution grids uh, and computing storm surge with modified shallow water equations on very large computers. And many of you will have seen these things. Uh, and, and these are what are used for flood insurance rate maps and things like that and, and reconstructing what happened after a storm. The alternative to that is to use low resolution simulations, but run a couple of thousand of them prior to a hurricane landfall, which is almost certainly being done right at this second or the landfall coming to Texas. And then you can get not as high accuracy, but you can see what the errors are from track and from uh, pressure deficit and, and, and so on. Uh, this uh, picture shows uh, the Hurricane Ike maximum surge computed using uh, ADCIRC for the case of the last house standing, which is right there. Um, you can see it's clustered close to shore. Uh, the, the highest surge, highest surge is around five meters-ish. Um, and uh, just for uh, reference, New Orleans is here, Houston is here, and Galveston is, is right here, partly underwater. Um, so the highest surge was actually in an area that didn't have too many people, which was kind of lucky. Could have been a lot worse. Okay, so that's surge. Now let's go to waves. Um, for inundation, the basic rule is surge gets things wet and sometimes makes things float away. Waves knock them down. So we need to know about waves. So here is an image of a, a simple image of a wave. We have the wave height, H, crest to trough. We have a wave length, which is the horizontal distance between two crests or two troughs. We have a wave period, and the period is the um, time between two consecutive wave crests or troughs to pass your position. Uh, these are all irregular statistical, so we'll need some sort of statistical measures. We'll worry about that later on. We won't get into very much, but there are a few things you should know. So if we have a wave period here, oh, and typical um, waves in a normal ocean might be six, eight seconds. Um, typical waves in a hurricane might be 12 seconds. In deep water, the wavelength is proportional to the period squared. So if you have, go from six seconds to 12 seconds, you'll have four times longer wavelength. The wave speed right here, which is just the length over the period, um, is proportional to the wave period. So if you go from six seconds to 12 seconds, you double the speed. So the longest period waves arrive there first. There's one more thing called the group velocity, um, which I'm not going to explain because it's confused generations of graduate students. Um, but essentially, the energy propagating does not go at the same speed as the wave. Why? Um, that would take a half an hour to explain, so I'm not going to but um, it, it travels about half the speed in deep water. And all of these are different in finite depths and shallow water. These are deep water things. In shallow water, these things all exist, but they're, they have different relations. This is what a deep water wave orbit looks like. So each of these little dots is following a water particle according to a simple theory. And you can see up at the surface, they're going in almost uh, perfect circles. In fact, in infinite depth, it is a perfect circle. And then there's a decay with depth. In, in deep water, it is a pure exponential decay, not a, these fake things that you, um, people just say something's exponential. This is a real exponential decay. So once you get past um, half a wavelength, it's pretty low. Once you get past the full wave, wavelength depth, it's, it's, it's nothing almost there. Um, so the velocity is decreased to the bed. So nothing in the bed affects anything at the surface in deep water. Okay, so that, that's basic waves. How are they generated? Everyone knows that wind generates waves. Everyone knows that. Um, they generate waves that are random, so you can't just give one measure of a wave. It has to be some sort of statistical measure. And I'm not going to give real details, but um, generally the significant wave height, which is a type of statistical measure, is used and the peak period. Other measures can be used. We'll, we'll go with these because everyone, um, they're easier to understand. And the statistical uh, significant wave height is if you were to look at a wave field and you would just say the wave height is two meters, that would be somewhere around the significant wave height. Now, how is it um, related with wind? Uh, for an infinite ocean, maybe this should be a W, uh, the significant wave height is proportional to the wind speed squared. So uh, if you double the wind speed, 
you will have four times the significant wave height. Now, if you keep scaling it up for hurricanes, you get impossible things very quickly um, that could never happen. And the reason is that this is for an infinite ocean, an infinite time, and infinite depth. So in reality, things constrain that. A finite fetch fetches the distance over which the wind blows. That for hurricanes is never large enough to get the um, equilibrium or the fully developed wave height. Finite duration, again, hurricanes don't go on at the same place for um, you know, several days, except for Hurricane Harvey maybe. And sometimes there's a finite depth, especially when you get close to the shore. So for simple situations, we can look at what this looks like. Um, the dimensionless groups will collapse to a series of curves. So in, in fluid mechanics, which is this part of fluid mechanics, everything goes dimensionless because it, it makes things a lot simpler and, and helps to, to uh, go across scales. So here's a simple dimensionless wave uh, height. So the small waves here, large waves here, this is the dimensionless wave height and dimensionless fetch, short fetch, so wind's not blowing over much. Uh, a long distance here is a very long fetch and each of these lines is a different depth from deep water, from infinite depth right here to shallow water. Now for short fetches, except in very shallow water, all these guys are along the same curve. And the reason they're all along the same curve is because the waves cannot feel the bottom. They're effectively in deep water, um, not uh, exactly, but close enough that it doesn't really matter. As you start getting the different fetches, right here, we leave this curve and we eventually reach an equilibrium point. So right about here um, with a fetch of say 100, uh, 1500 dimensionless, these waves are not going to ever get any bigger. If we were in deeper water, they can still get bigger and bigger and bigger and so on until we reach the infinite depth. So this is the basics of how it works. For long, long fetches in deep water, you get the largest waves. And this is the limiting wave, which you never get during a hurricane. Now, this is very simple. Um, it doesn't work that well for hurricanes because we don't have uh, infinite time that these things blow. In real world situations, people tend to use more complex numerical models. And these use uh, time histories, uh, lots of inputs, time history of winds, which uh, at least one of the people on the uh, webinar uh, spends his time making. Uh, topography and bathymetry, very important in shallow water, doesn't really matter in deep water. Bottom friction, also important in shallow water, and storm surge time series. So if the storm surge increases the water level at the shoreline by five meters, that's going to change how the uh, waves behave because deeper water means bigger waves. Um, structured or unstructured grids, most of these things uh, require large parallel computers, particularly if, you, if you're trying to get high accuracy or if you're trying to do uh, forecasts or, or just um, now cast. Uh, some typical models uh, shown right here. And going back to Hurricane Ike, this is just a, a plot pulled from a paper uh, which shows uh, the wave field in Hurricane Ike. If you look at the scale here, the reds are 8 to 11 meters, and so the max height here is about 11 meters, significant wave height. Again, New Orleans, oh actually no, where's New Orleans? New Orleans right here, um, and Houston, Galveston, and this is the last house standing. You'll also see that the wave heights close to shore are smaller than they are in deep water. This shelf is fairly shallow and wide, so the friction and other processes limit the wave heights here. I mean, the wave, uh, as at landfall, they'd be a bit larger, but they will always be smaller in wide shelves because they, they just get knocked down by friction. But pretty complex. Okay, so that was deep water. So now let's go into finite depths. Um, as the waves go into finite depths, you have new processes and they're quite different. Um, refraction uh, is a change in wavelength and direction from depth changes. Shoaling is uh, changes in wave height from things that we're not gonna discuss, but they're, they're important in some situations. Um, with refraction, you can get focusing and defocusing. It's, it's very much like um, light refraction. Uh, and focusing is like a magnifying glass um, and so on. Bottom friction, we talked about that. It will only, always dissipate energy in deep water, it doesn't matter. In finite depths, it can matter, especially over long distances. And then when you get close to the shore, wave breaking is very important. 
Again, close to shore, increases in water depth from storm surge can be quite important. Okay, this is what a shallow water wave looks like. It's the same height as before. And if you watch it, you'll notice a couple of things. One is that the orbits for the same height are much longer. And at the surface, they're pretty much elliptical. At the bed, they're going, they don't have any vertical motion because they can't go into the bed, but their horizontal motion is almost the same distance as it is at the surface. And that changes things. That affects the, the properties quite a lot. Um, in particular, friction, uh, you can imagine that if this was a rough bed, uh, there would be considerable friction here because the velocities at the bed are quite large. Okay, so other processes, uh, refraction. So if you have a wave and you go along a wave crest, so here's a wave crest here, and this is in shallower water. In shallow water, the wave is slower. In uh, deeper water, the wave is faster. And if the wave speed varies, then the wave direction will vary. This is called refraction. And so the wave will change its angle. It tends to make crests more parallel to bottom contours. So high angles offshore become small angles near shore. Um, there are theories where you can show how it affects wave heights. Uh, the, the takeaway here is it's very similar in many ways to light refraction. There are also other processes going on, but refraction is very similar to light refraction. So whatever you've learned, Snell's law, it applies here, not exactly, because um, there are other things, but a lot of it applies here. One example of wave refraction is wave focusing and defocusing. So if you have a point and bottom contours that look like this, a point going out and you have a, a bay here, it tends to focus energy towards the point and defocus energy from the bay. So points generally have much higher uh, wave energy. Those of you who've looked up the JAWS surfing site in Maui, um, th this is similar to what it has here. It has underwater point, which focuses the waves for certain wavelengths and causes giant waves. Um, important in some situations, uh, not as important in other situations. Okay, wave breaking. Wave breaking uh, happens when water depth is too shallow. It can also happen in deep water. We're going to ignore that. The type of wave breaking depends on the wave properties in the setting. Uh, the, there we go. So for the purposes of loading and structural damage, the worst case is almost always when waves break directly onto a structure, as we're seeing here. You can see the big splash up, the waves broke almost directly on that structure and caused a large load. This is from Oregon State University's Wave Basin, um, videos taken by Joaquin, uh, and causes large uh, loading. You can also see, I'm gonna to refer to this again, there are some, uh, it's, there are many rows of structures here and we'll look at how the loads vary going inland. Um, okay, but, but, so what happens when the waves break and, and they, they hit? So this is an example of what's called a flip through wave impact. And this is from a, an older paper, but it's very, very nice. So here the wave is coming and it's hitting this wall right here. And at this point, almost all parts of the wave are hitting the wall at the same time. So a very um, sudden impact. And if all parts of the wall, wave are hitting the wall, there's nowhere for the water to go but up and causes very high velocities. These distances, this is 50 millimeters, so five centimeters. And these red colors are nine meters per second. So we're getting really, really high velocities um, from extremely high pressures over a small area that cause giant jets. Um, this is often when you get the highest load magnitude on structures. Uh, this type of impact and ones that are like it, where, where you have a sudden impact, uh, the water has nowhere to go, sudden acceleration, and you get these jets going up. And these are always short duration. Wave impacts, wave loading can be much longer duration, Impact is always short duration. Okay, well, we'll get back to that later on. The other thing is infragravity motions. And um, a lot of people who aren't in coastal type things don't know about this. Um, and the basics are wave often arrives in groups. If you go down to the lake or the ocean and you just watch it and it's, it's not horribly confused, you'll see a bunch of large waves followed by a bunch of small waves and a bunch of large waves. Surfers rely on this. And 
This means that when they break, uh, they release momentum in ways that I'm not going to talk about, and it produces some low frequency motions that can be very large. So say we have 12 second waves that come in and uh, a group of 12 second waves breaks, and then a, a smaller group that doesn't break as strongly, another uh, group of, of waves that breaks that's larger. These low frequency motions uh, may be several minutes. So we'll say one to two, we'll say two minutes. And so you have 12 second waves producing much lower frequency motions. And on gentle slopes or flat reefs, these will dominate the wave run-up signatures. And the Typhoon High End video is a very nice example of that. I'm gonna show you one more example. And this is from Wales. Um, this is a, an Atlantic storm, it's in a bay here. You can see the uh, this amateur video. This is taken by a guy going down there who runs a surf shop and it looks pretty confused. Um, there's some weird stuff going on here, wa waves going sideways and then a second from now, so dry land, infragravity wave coming in, it's about to hit the seawall. Let's start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten seconds it went from completely dry to this guy's car getting very fortunate not to be picked up and floating away into the storm. Um, and, and this type of thing, this is an extreme example um, that photographs very nicely, but there's another infragravity wave. It, it, it's pretty common. Here's a bigger one. I think the tide's coming in a little bit, but this type of loading in many situations, but not all, um, will dominate. And especially again on flat or gently sloping uh, beaches. And, and you don't wanna be anywhere near the, the shoreline during this. So those are infragravity waves. So what does that lead to? Well, it leads to inundation. You have the, the waves, you have the surge, you have the infragravity waves, you have uh, wave run up um, and it causes inundation. This is taken from Hurricane Michael in Mexico Beach. These lines are all um, high water marks that were measured by a couple of teams that went down there. And the maximum surge was about 5.2 meters measured by the one instrument there. And the maximum run up here and here uh, was several meters higher, um, 7.2 meters. And this was on the side of a steep hill. So what happened was you had the infragravity waves and then on a steep hill, you got individual wave run up and it went quite high. Um, and the wave heights here, 10 to 20 meters inland offshore will change quite strongly. And also the inund depths, inundation depths can change very strongly in short distances, especially when you get near the shoreline. So it's, it's difficult to predict parcel level or structure level loading. This, this is a, a big challenge. One example of run up that many of you probably haven't seen, uh, this is from the Philippines. Uh, and this boulder right here is at around 13 meters elevation. And during Typhoon Haiyan, which was a horrible storm, uh, it moved 12 meters from its old position, which was over here somewhere, to this right here. This shows you an example, or an example that shows you its setting. So it's on top of a pretty big cliff uh, and it's fairly far inland. So if you were to stand at the cliff and say, oh, could this boulder move? And you look at it, even if you have a lot of experience to say, there's no way, but, but they can. So this is run up that is strong enough to move a boulder, which I think was about seven meters long um, and 77 tons, give or take. So these types of things can go to quite high elevations and have quite high loads. If it's strong enough to move that boulder, it's strong enough to damage a structure. Um, it's strong enough to completely destroy a wooden structure. Okay, so now we have a, a very basic idea of what the uh, processes are. So let's go to wave loading. So wave loading occurs when a structure accelerates the fluid around it. That's the basic definition, mostly pressure driven. So if you can figure out the pressures, you got most of it. There's some frictional drag, which is usually just ignored. This is an example of a loading time series, time and load on a simple structure. This has a very high slamming load. So very high short duration load and then much lower afterwards. Here's another example of a load that was from uh, uh, an experiment actually at Oregon State and numerical and uh, laboratory. It also has a peak, but the peak is nowhere near as large as um, the other one. Um, so it's a combination of quasi steady, which is, is this part and the 
slamming load right here. Okay, so those are some basics. What, what are, how are they represented in, in standards? So ASC 716, um, the flood loads are actually very simple compared to many of the other chapters, very, very simple. So current loads are computed as an equivalent increased depth and then uh, back minus front or front minus back um, loading. Uh, for wave loads, it always assumes breaking waves. This is for breaking waves on a wall. There is a, uh, an equivalent hydrostatic loading from a reflected wave and then a dynamic loading where the CP varies on, on the uh, uh, structure category. Um, and it assumes breaking waves is the worst case. There are other ones. Um, they don't account, account for sheltering and, sheltering and they always assume breaking waves. So that's ASCE. Um, it's essentially the worst case scenario that the people could come up with. That's going to change the next revision. Um, we'll see what that looks like. Tsunami loads, I'm not going to talk too much more about them. They're much more complex. Um, they are based on the maximum considered tsunami, which is defined by ASCE uh, with several types of analysis. Energy grade line is much simpler, still a fair bit of work. Probabilistic tsunami hazard analysis is a huge amount of work. Um, probabilistic means you have to define the probability of certain uh, forcing and certain uh, responses, um, mainly for category four structures, which are like hospitals and, and things like that. Um, there are debris impact loads and very, very large erosional depths up to uh, 12 feet or so, um, which, which makes designing foundations uh, quite challenging. So tsunami loads, are much more complex. They have a lot in common with uh, hurricane loads, but they're, they're not exactly the same. Uh, there's, in addition to the standards, there are many, many other uh, documents uh, in the literature that look at wave loading. I've just given a few examples here, elevated jetties and piers, seawalls, breakwaters, um, many things on this. Uh, slamming loads, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, and rather than just going by it, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes deriving a, a simplified version um, of slamming loads so you can see how some of these things come about. So slamming loads are high magnitude and short duration, and that makes them a little simpler. Okay, so how do we do it? So everyone who's taken a fluid mechanics course has learned the case of a deflected jet. So that is when a steady jet comes and it hits something and it changes its angle. And that will cause a load on whatever is changing the angle. And uh, the, the, the load is proportional to the jet velocity squared. And there's a deflection angle for it. no deflection angle, one minus cos zero is zero. Um, for 90 degrees, one minus cos 90, which is zero, is one. And for 180 degrees, so it's deflecting all the way back, um, one minus minus one is two. So it varies based on the deflection angle. And it works very well for steady or slowly varying flow. It does not work for impacts. Um, it does not work because this is purely steady and based on, it's thrown away all the time variation. Let's look at what happens for steady impacts. And we're actually a little fortunate because we can get analytical solutions that can be adapted to see what the slamming load is. So those of you who've taken differential equations course, which is I'm pretty sure all of you, and those of you who remember anything from that, which is probably not as many, um, will remember that you can do infinite series for many of these things based on boundary value problems. So our problem is we have a, a rectangular jet infinite in the uh, left direction and uh, constant velocity V, it hits a wall and immediately after impact, infinitesimally after impact, the velocity is zero right here. And that causes um, uh, a response that we can actually solve for analytically with infinite uh, Fourier series um, in, in 2D. Well, it's, it's Fourier uh, and, uh, and uh, exponential. It's complex arithmetic or calculus. So the width of the jet is W. The velocity is V. So this is, these are uh, velocity vector plots of the velocity before it hits the wall. And this is after um, from the series. Some of you may notice Gibbs phenomenon at the corners uh, where there's a discontinuity, Fourier series don't do that as well. So before, after, before, after. If we look at that, so offshore, not much difference. Onshore, big difference. And what we can do is we can say, well, let's look at the momentum. So this has a momentum, this has momentum. The difference in momentum is the momentum absorbed by the wall. So if we do that, we can figure out the momentum deficit per unit width wall. 
this is an analytical solution. This is the numerical result of an infinite series. Um, the uh, width squared times u. So it's a little strange because our, our other things had u squared. This only has u and it's the width squared. Um, it's proportional to the width squared because if you double the width of the jet, it goes offshore double as well. So it becomes w squared. To get the force is the rate of change of momentum with respect to time. We don't know what this time is. So let's make some assumptions. We're gonna assume that it occurs in some distance dx and that distance dx is some small fraction of the jet width. So delta is a dimensionless number. We don't know what it is. I'll make it up and say 0.1 at, of the jet width. So in that distance, it goes from v to zero or w to zero. Uh, and then we can find the time that corresponds to because we know the, the speed or from u to zero. Um, we know the speed right here. And then if we put that in, we've got delta momentum, we've got dt right here. And then we get this, the max load is this right here. And we've, we're gonna have to cancel a few things, but I want you to see that it all depends on this delta, which we don't really know. Uh, if the impact is more sudden, this delta will be smaller and our load will be higher. If the impact is spread out over more time, then the, impact, uh, the max load will be lower. And because we don't know this, this all gets thrown into some mega kludge and we call it a slamming coefficient. And this slamming coefficient has um, a range of values that it could have. Um, and in fact, slamming is very, very difficult to replicate. You can do a hundred different slamming experiments in the Oregon State Wave Basin using exactly the same uh, input conditions, letting the tank go between hand, um, and you'll, you'll get a hundred different values. So this actually looks like drag, but it has a much larger coefficient. Okay, so loading. Let's go to loading using CFD. I'm not gonna talk too much about this. This is becoming very common these days. Um, it's the most general, but requires very substantial computational resources. And because of that, people do short simulations. The other problem with it is that you, you need a lot of computational resources. Um, this is a, just one example of CFD and loading. This is a, a wave uh, going through the 10 by 10 building array that I talked about earlier. Um, if you do a whole bunch of these for a whole bunch of different cases, uh, for a whole bunch of conditions, and look at the loads on all of these things, you can come up with things. Combine them with the laboratory experiments, uh, which I, I showed you, but um, we don't have time to get into, and you can get what's going on inside the building array. Again, this is just one example, a different case of waves going through the building array. Um, the transmission and loads here and here and here will be different from at the first row. Let's find out what they're like. And generally they decrease going into the array. So this, these two graphs are the results using different, what are called load reduction factors um, for uh, different scenarios. And they're um, based on the number of rows providing shelter. So zero means it's the first row, one means there's one row providing shelter, so it's second row and so on. And you'll notice that the loads go down. And these are just different, different definitions of load reduction factor, which we won't get into. But the loads go down um, pretty strongly too. Um, these are all for scenarios where you have a street, a straight line street, and then a straight line row of buildings and a straight line street. If you don't, if you have offsets, it can be different. And offsets for the second row, you can have high loads that are similar or sometimes even a little higher than the first row. So uh, that, that can be a major scenario, but once you get to the third row, everything goes down. So as you go further inland, you always get significant decreases in load compared to what you would if there weren't anything sheltering it. Important for a lot of things. Okay, so let's go to structural damage. Um, so fragilities are significantly behind wind and seismic design for uh, load, load and structural response. Um, in large part because so much work has been gone into figuring out the conditions, the hazard at the site. Um, the first ones were empirical or semi-empirical. This is a FEMA thing that's been used a lot. Um, so this is freeboard uh, here. It means low inundation depths, high inundation depths, and the damage ratio. This was derived from claims data. It's very, very commonly used. Um, you take the inundation depth as the uh, surge plus wave uh, crest minus the uh, elevation of the structure 
structure and, and, and you get that purely empirical. Makes a bit of sense though. Here's a slightly different one, which was, uh, looks at the slamming load and the collapse probability. This is from Hurricane Ike, actually very close to the last house standing. And what we get are for lower slamming loads, we have low collapse probability and then increasing to high probability. These are for different age ranges of houses, the newest and the oldest. This is empirical as well, but again, it makes some sense. Um, using standard structural tools, this is just starting. Uh, here is something from uh, Bernier and Paget, uh, looking at the uh, buckling fragilities for above ground storage tanks, uh, using uh, structural response and, and predicted wave loading. I'm not going to get into it. These exist, they're only just getting started now. Okay, so at community scale. So we've looked at individual structures, not too much, but we have looked at it. But let's look at community scale. And at community scale, it's again, different from wind and seismic. So at community scale, what people try to do is not to resist the wave and surge loads, but to avoid them. And in large part, this is because this is what FEMA mandates in its uh, insurance. Um, and FEMA, if, they, if you can't get insurance, but then you can't do much. So avoid strategy, distance inland, elevation, breakwater, seawall dune structures, all of these tend to uh, reduce the load felt by the structure. So distance inland is pretty self-explanatory, but what do you do if your um, structure is already near the coast? Um, well, one of the most common things is called beach nourishment, which uh, is where you dredge up a lot of offshore sand or from somewhere else and you increase the width of the beach. And a lot of people think this is mainly for recreation. So people can have a nice wide beach. Uh, this is actually true, but the justification for these, the cost justification is usually done with damage reduction because it's much easier to do a cost benefit analysis that shows a positive um, response using looking at damage reduction compared to uh, recreation costs. In fact, it, you didn't even used to be able to do that. So this is a typical thing that's done um, or people build it further inland. Elevation, um, we saw very early that uh, high elevation structures um, had less damage and FEMA mandates this through its flood insurance rate maps. They set 100 year inundation for, from surge and wave modeling to give you an elevation um, in the VE zone and A zone, which are the most dangerous. And the X zone is out of the 100 year floodplain. So in, in these first two zones, you need insurance. In this last zone, you do not have to have insurance, but it might be a good idea. This, this works, but it all, doesn't always work. People in the X zone generally think, I'm fine. I have no need for anything. Um, right here, this is Hurricane Michael in Mexico Beach, Florida. So this requires a little explanation. The pink areas are the X zone. Here's the ocean. Each of these symbols is a structure. The red ones are things that were completely removed from their foundations. And if you look at the X zone versus uh, <coughs> excuse me, the structures, you can see that um, this does not always work. And this is one example. You can show many more examples. So how do we reduce the loads? Well, one way is to put something strong in front um, that will reduce the wave heights. A natural experiment for that was in Hurricane Sandy. Jennifer Irish, Pat Lynette um, looked at two locations. One had a seawall that was buried under the dune and no one even knew it was there. Uh, during the storm, it was eroded, but the seawall still stayed there. And they found, this is a little complex, but if you didn't have a seawall, you had a higher load potential. And if you did have a seawall, you had a lower load potential. So Location with the seawall had much lower damage than the location without the seawall. Again, typical, reducing load rather than trying to um, armor against it. Now for reinforced concrete, that's a bit different, but for wooden structures, you try and increase, um, reduce the load. Okay, so now we're getting into one of my pet peeves. So wind engineering category two structures designed for 700 year return periods. Some aspects of earthquake design specify 2% chance in 50 years, which translates to a 2,475 year return period. Tsunami design, same thing, 2% in 50 years. FEMA mandates 100 year return periods. And if you look at a structure, so let's look at 50 years. If you mandate a 100 year flood zone, there's a 40% chance of that being exceeded over a 50 year period. 40% chance being exceeded. 
Wind, it's 7%. Earthquake and tsunami, if you use the uh, 2475 for return period, it's 2%. So the standards for structures in the coastal zone are much, much lower than in other zones. One of the reasons is angry homeowners. Actually, that's the major reason, um, but it, it doesn't work that well. Damage reduction and resilience, um, we're coming to the end. Uh, individual structures, there are many things you can do. A lot of them involve um, reducing loads on foundations. Well, armoring foundations is actually a very good idea. Um, raising utilities, elevating major structural components, um, hardening key structural components. Some things you can harden enough that um, they, they won't uh, break even if they do get some waves. And insurance, at the community scale, um, one of the big things is harden utilities and infrastructure. During Hurricane Sandy, there are many neighborhoods in New Jersey that had perfect um, houses, perfect roads, but they had no electricity, no water, no gas, no sewage. And so people couldn't go back to their houses for two or three months. Um, if they did have better utilities, much, much fewer problems. Soft measures, uh, dunes or vegetation to reduce, or hard walls, breakwaters can reduce the wave heights and then the loading. And then community building codes. Um, very often communities will specify greater building codes than the 100 year event. Um, and, and that's always very helpful, although people don't like it. Okay, future research. So I haven't talked at all about sediment transport and erosion. This is when waves and surge and currents move sand and, and clay and mud and everything around. This is the most difficult topic ever. Um, time scales are mil milliseconds to um, 100 years. Length scales are millimeters or submillimeter to uh, 100 kilometers or even longer. Um, but very, very important because it affects a lot of the loading, uh, what waves and surge can get there and the loading. Um, local wave loading and structural failure modes, there's not a whole lot in this. Um, and then community scale effects. Uh, sea level changes, also important. I'll throw in storm debris, which people are just starting to study and we're starting to get some good results on that. So with that, I will finish and I will be able to take any questions from people. Thank you. And this shows um, almost all of the uh, references that I, I talked about during the, uh, the seminar. So take a screenshot. Thank you, Professor Kennedy. Uh, this was an extremely informative presentation. Uh, at this time, we'll transition to questions and answers. Attendees are reminded uh, that questions should be submitted to the moderator through the chat panel. Um, and we, we have a, had a few questions. Um, uh, the first one, hopefully, is the easiest. Uh, was the video at the beginning of your presentation, this was on your title slide, a tsunami or a very long period wind wave? It was closest to an infragravity wave. Um, it was, tsunamis are very difficult to simulate accurately in, in wave tanks because they're just too long period. Um, and it, it was certainly longer than a typical wind, wind wave. Um, so it would be closer to an infragravity wave, much like what we saw in Poles Heath in Wales or um, in, uh, in Hurricane Typhoon Haiyan at the beginning when the house got washed away. Okay. We also have many other um, wind waves and uh, tsunami, war tsunami-like waves um, tested there. This was just one example I showed. Okay. Uh, we have a quick clarification from um, Ian Robertson. Uh, he wants to clarify that the shielding effect only applies if all of the buildings survive structurally uh, and have no openings to allow through flow. So that's an interesting comment or a relevant comment from the, the videos you shared. Yes, um, if, if you do not have, uh, if, if the building in front of it is destroyed, then there's no shielding, except for maybe a very short time while it's being destroyed. Um, so it does require that the structures remain intact. And that actually leads to uh, a potential design uh, scenario where the structures in the first row are designed to higher standards um, to resist, or at least partially resist loads, and the buildings in uh, subsequent rows do not have to have as uh, high, low resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were a couple of question, questions about your open foam simulations. I think these were the 10 by 10 grid. Mm -hmm. The questions are, are uh, related to uh, the computational um, demands or, or what were the computational demands for those simulations? Okay, so uh, 
I can't remember for any particular simulation, but most of them were run on 96 cores and they had about one millimeter resolution at laboratory scale, um, not everywhere, but around the structures. And those took approximately several days to a week. Um, one issue with open foam is it does not scale perfectly. So we had many, many hundreds and thousands more cores, but when we keep adding the, uh, the resolution and more cores, it, it maxes out. Um, this also makes it difficult to simulate uh, wind waves. Wind waves, um, you need, even at laboratory scale, at least 10 minutes to get good statistics, and that, that can be very difficult. Um, so this, this is actually an area which needs to improve. If anyone can improve the parallel performance of open foam um, for water waves, I would be very, very grateful, actually. And my students would even be more grateful. Fantastic. Um, are there researchers uh, attempting to use reduced order modeling uh, based on CFD to allow for simulation of a larger number of cases than for using pure CFD? Uh, for hurricane inundations and wave structure interaction? Uh, the answer, um, and I guess it depends exactly what they mean by reduced order models, but yeah, people um, are now using uh, surrogate models um, to take discrete examples of wave loading, wave inundation, and so on, and try and extend those to uh, cases which may be not too far from uh, where they, what they've simulated and to get uh, really quick probabilistic estimates. And so that is going on. Um, it's, it's a very active area of research and a very important area of research, um, but uh, it, it will continue in the future because it, there's no scenario where people can compute 20,000 CFD runs at appropriate resolution. Um, that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. If we talk about uh, the structural risk for a, a community or a building, um, how do you um, go about finding the structural risk? Um, and then there's a follow-up question uh, about multi-hazard risk. Um, so I guess the first question is going to be about uh, finding out more about the risk for a community or a building. Okay, so. Okay, so um, there's a, a long process. So first you have to figure out the potential, the probabilistics of the storm surge and wind waves, say some not too far distance from the shore. So you'll need a wave height and a storm surge probabilistic um, analysis to get some sort of numbers for whatever you're interested in. And I'm not sure what this person's interested in, but you'll need that. And then you have to take those through to the shoreline to get to the structural location uh, and apply your favorite wave loading and structural fragility um, estimates. And that should give you the probabilistics. So there, there's a pretty long chain. If, if you're lucky, very lucky, someone's already done the first bits and you can just take those and, and run the second bits. This is actually what reduced order models are, are pretty good for. If you can get this um, for a good enough set, it may give you uh, well, the first four, it may give you what's going on for some of the rest, but it, it's a pretty long process. Mm -hmm. and, and if we talk about, um, maybe you, you talked about the, uh, not multi-hazard, but, but different hazard risk, uh, the risk from different hazards, um, how do we achieve a risk consistent design uh, for multi-hazard, for a multi-hazard setting? That's a good question, and um, I, I don't really have a good answer for that, actually. Um, I think it starts with good risk, um, estimates of the risk for each hazard, and after that, it goes into places that I don't know very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question is, uh, FEMA uses, and I'm gonna, um, not, I don't know this acronym, so W-H-A-F-I-S, is that? Uh, Yes, Wafis. Uh, software to simulate overland surge and wave propagation, and it does include shielding parameters. Uh, what physical processes are missing in that model that should be included? Oh, uh, 
Are you familiar with, with that software? Yes, I, I, am, I am familiar with it. Um, uh, WAFIS, for those who don't know it, it is a quite old uh, 1D transect model. And it, uh, I don't know when it was first made, but 1970s, I believe. Um, and the answer is it's missing all 2D processes. It's missing a lot of uh, more complex uh, wave transformation. It, it has sheltering, but the sheltering is pretty rudimentary. Um, friction, uh, more realistic wave breaking. It's, it's, it has things, but uh, the processes it represents in almost all cases have been superseded by better representations of, of things. So I, I would really say it, it can represent a lot of things, but it can't represent them at the state of the art. Fantastic. We have time just for one last question. And um, you, um, you talked about everything from experimental work to even observations of, of, uh, of events uh, coming on shore, uh, you talked about simulations. How, how do you combine um, uh, information and data from all of these different sources to, to improve community resilience? Okay, well, one way, the, the, the way that has been most applied is take observational data and use it to validate and constrain models. Because observational data, for the most part, is points. You have a data here, here, here at this time, this other time, but models give much more complete uh, coverage. So the most common thing that has been used is to constrain the models and validate the models using the observational data and then extend the range of what's been done uh, for uh, predictions and, and, and so on. This is done both for, for example, storm surge and, and water waves and also uh, fragility curves. Um, many observations of damage have been used to constrain fragility curves in, in many instances, and then those curves may be used in new situations. So usually the observational data constrains some sort of theory or model that you have, or, or maybe one that you develop um, based on these new observations. Okay, well, we're at the conclusion of today's Sim Center webinar. On behalf of the attendees, thank you, Professor Kennedy, for this great introduction to inundation and wave loading. Uh, to the attendees, thank you for your great questions. For additional upcoming webinars, uh, please check the Sim Center's website at simcenter.designsafe-ci.org. Check your inbox for emails from announce at designsafe-ci that will have registration, list, uh, registration links and uh, sign up to receive the Sim Center's uh, community newsletter. Thank you for attending today's webinar.